is the Director of Pediatric Infectious Disease at Cook Children's in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Whitworth was instrumental in helping the staff at Cook Children's make their own decisions about vaccination. In addition to the compassion and attention that Dr. Whitworth offers to patients and families, she spent 2020 and the first part of 2021 tirelessly responding to the changes associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Her leadership, calm presence, and careful explanations are invaluable to all of us at Cook Children's, and we hope you find them to be equally meaningful. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Whitworth. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for your kind words. I'm gonna to talk today about the COVID vaccines and give you an update about how they were developed and, and how beneficial we think that, that they are. The first thing I'd like to talk about today is Operation Warp Speed and explain to you how that worked and the benefits of that program then I'm going to review the messenger RNA vaccines, particularly Pfizer, but really Pfizer and Moderna are very much the same as far as their safety and efficacy. And that data will um, be, be really applicable to both vaccines. The Johnson and Johnson product at the time of this recording is on hold, but that data can, will be forthcoming also. Operation Warp Speed is a government industry collaboration to safely develop therapeutics and vaccines to treat and prevent SARS-CoV-2. And remember SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the coronavirus that causes a, a disease that we call COVID-19. So the government and industry together developed vaccines and medications to treat this illness and prevent it from occurring as much as possible. The government paid for production of hundreds of millions of vaccine doses at the same time that they were being developed, knowing that some of these vaccines would not work and they would, the government paid for those vaccines to be destroyed. And a vaccine, the goal was for a vaccine to be immediately ready on the day that the FDA released an emergency use authorization. And so just to compare it for you, here are the timelines for the development of vaccines, the um, historical timeline and the timeline for the development of the COVID vaccines during Operation Warp Speed. <clears throat> and so if you'll look at this top bar with me, that 73 month timeline you could apply to any of the common vaccines that we use, such as a tetanus shot, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, polio vaccine, Prevnar vaccine. The general vaccines that we use today, with the exception of flu shots, the general vaccines that we use today from the time that it is decided they are needed for the population until the time there is actually a shot in an arm is roughly six years. And that is because they spend months doing research and development, years doing trials with the vaccine. Once the vaccine goes to the FDA and gets approved, then the companies start making the vaccines and that takes over a year just to make them. Then the companies start shipping them out and to get them into offices takes about six months. So every bit of that was done for the COVID vaccines except it was not done sequentially, it was done all at the same time. Each, thing, each step was done at the same time, um, knowing that if a vaccine was developed that didn't work, the government would pay the company back and that would be that, the vaccine would be gone. And so for this warp speed, everything was done, but it was done in about 12 to 14 months. One of the things that was helpful for warp speed was the knowledge about messenger RNA technology. These vaccines have been studied for years, partially as cancer treatment vaccines and other vaccines. And so when the pandemic started, it was known by scientists around the world that messenger RNA technology could be done quickly. And 
the machines that develop the messenger RNA, the scientists knew about that, that technology. There was an infrastructure, fortunately for you and me, that was in labs ready to go. And so that shortened that initial research and development time because the technology was available. And then the second thing you need in a clinical trial is you need about 40,000 volunteers to either get a vaccine or get a placebo. And if you're doing that for a tetanus shot, that phase two and phase three, the light blue and the light gray bands on here, it takes about, about four years, three and a half to four years to get enough volunteers to get a shot or a placebo to study the results. But in the time of the pandemic, when the company said, we need 40,000 volunteers, instead of taking four years, they had 40,000 volunteers in a week. And so that time period was significantly shortened. And then at the same time, they're doing injection and placebo trials, the company started manufacturing 100 million doses. They didn't know if the vaccine would work or not. They knew they might have to throw away 100 million doses, but they started them anyway so that they would be ready. When you do a vaccine trial, before you ever start, you work together with statisticians and scientists and you decide that out of these 40,000 people, if we can have about 200 infections, we can open up all the envelopes and unblind it and figure out if there were more or less infections in the placebo group than in the vaccine group. So before this ever started, an end point of about 200 infections in that whole pool of 40,000 people was known. At the end of that time, when the envelopes were opened and it was shown that the vaccine was remarkably better than the placebo, they presented the data to the FDA. And the FDA gets reams of paperwork to go through every adverse event, every abnormal lab. They carefully reviewed that and granted an emergency use authorization. And that was done the second week of December. And the FDA to Pfizer said yes, and a week or two later said yes to Moderna. And because the man vaccines were manufactured, they were not shipped a year later, they were shipped the next day. Because there was already a plan in place for where they would go and how they would get there, it didn't take six months to distribute the vaccine, it took three months. So Operation Warp Speed was done quickly, but there were no corners cut in this and I felt very safe about how it was done. And so I'd like to explain to you, now that you have that as a framework, I'd like to explain how a messenger RNA vaccine works. This is a picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And of course it's not red and purple, but this is the diagram that makes it easier to think about. These purple protrusions on the virus are spike proteins. And if your body can recognize those spike proteins and attack them, you can prevent yourself from the virus making you sick and doing damage. This is what an antibody looks like. And the antibodies we make against the spike proteins, if you get sick, you make antibodies against the spike proteins, to, if you get sick with coronavirus, or if you get vaccinated, you make antibodies to the spike protein. On the left side of this diagram is a yellow molecule with a pink strand of RNA in messenger RNA in the center. The yellow molecule for the Pfizer and for the Moderna vaccines is a lipid or a fatty particle. Very common to have those particles similar to that in our bodies. And what happens is this lipid and this particle are, in, are inserted into a cell near the injection. So a muscle cell near the injection or a, a white blood cell floating near the site. This pink squiggly messenger RNA particle is transcribed and it is used to form these purple grape cluster spike proteins that you see here 
and those spike proteins that are not COVID virus, they're just the spike proteins from the COVID virus are, are released into the bloodstream. And when that happens, our bodies can make antibodies against the spike proteins. And when we do the antibodies against the spike proteins, it, it's important to know that that is similar to your body getting a Snapchat from this uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. The RNA goes in, your body recognizes a spike protein from that point forward, and the Snapchat or the vaccine goes away quickly. The work is done, you will know what to, what to do next if your body's exposed again. And it's important to note that messenger RNA vaccines do not contain this whole SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, they only give instructions for the spike protein. So you can't get COVID-19 disease from the vaccine because you're not exposed from the vaccine itself. You should also know that the genetic material that's injected into your deltoid muscle in your arm never goes into your DNA. It's not capable of doing it. It's the wrong molecule. And you should also know that messenger RNA molecules are really very fragile molecules. They are injected, they go in, they do their work, and then they just kind of dissolve and go away. That's why we call it like a Snapchat. It doesn't stay, it's gone. And, and that you can kind of think through that that's the reason that we have to be so careful with these vaccines. Some require a deep freeze, some require a regular freezer. You can't leave them out very long. They, they um, once you open the top, there's not any preservative in these vaccines. They will disintegrate and not work pretty quickly. And, and so think of it that way. You want it, it goes in, it does its job, and then the messenger RNA goes away. And so I want to look at particularly with you, the safety and the effectiveness data for the Pfizer vaccine, and know that in the interest of time, the data for Moderna is almost exactly the same. They are both messenger RNA vaccines, and they both are effective, and they both are safe. And so to get into a little bit of the weeds and the data for the Pfizer vaccine, I want to start out with the safety data. We know that sometimes when you get a vaccine, you can have side effects from a tetanus shot, from a hepatitis vaccine. You might feel achy or a little bit sore for the next day or two, and that was watched very closely in these clinical trials. And remember, there were roughly half and half um, in the clinical trials, half got placebo and half actually got the vaccine. So the top bar on this chart are for people that got vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. The bottom bar are people that got the placebo. And you can see that after the first dose in this slide, about 40%, 47% of the vaccinated people got fatigue compared to 33% of the placebo recipients. So there was more fatigue, there was more headache, there were more chills and general achiness and joint pain after one dose of the vaccine than there were if you got the placebo instead. And then when they looked at what happened three weeks later when you got the second dose of the vaccine, the vaccine recipients in this top bar had more fatigue, more headache, and more chills than the placebo group. And they had more muscle and joint pain than the placebo group. And certainly the side effects were a little worse in older individuals, I'm sorry, the side effects were a little worse in younger individuals than older individuals. And the side effects were a little worse after the second vaccine than they were after the first vaccine. But the side effects are almost 100% gone at 48 hours after the vaccine with a rare person having some side effects at 72 hours. Those who have symptoms beyond that time period probably are not exclusively having vaccine reactions. And you know that they looked at about 8,000 of the recipients for this so that's a lot of data. One of the things that you will see in the news about these vaccines would be 
what I think is an irritating headline that says 1,000 deaths after the COVID vaccine. And the when, when that was reported, what they didn't tell you is when you look at 40,000 people over several months of time, there are deaths in those people anyway. If you look at 40,000 people for two months, you can expect that by chance, some of those people are gonna have a heart attack. Some of those people are gonna get diagnosed with cancer. Some of those people will have a seizure disorder develop. Some of those people will be in a car wreck. Some of those people will drown. So during these trials, life happens for the vaccine group and life happens for the placebo group. And so what you have to ask is, were there more heart attacks in the vaccine group or more heart attacks in the placebo group? And if you look at this, this chart right here, the middle column, which is titled BNT, those are the vaccine recipients and the right column titled placebo are the placebo recipients. And statistically, any event was about the same in both groups. There was no difference in the rate of infections, no difference in the rate of cardiac disorders like heart attacks, no difference in vaccine versus placebo for nervous system disorders or cancer diagnoses, no difference in injuries or poisonings or anything like that. So life happened equally in both of these groups for the Pfizer vaccine, but the data was the same for the Moderna vaccine. And then you look at all causes of death in all of the vaccine compared to the placebo recipients. Two people in the vaccine group died, not of COVID disease. Four people in the placebo group died during that two month period. I believe one of these was thought to be COVID disease, but the others weren't. This is part of just life happens. And were there more deaths if you were vaccinated or if you got the placebo and there weren't? So then people say, well, this was given an emergency use authorization after two months of data. What about long-term side effects? And when you look at this scientifically, the serious side effects from all the other vaccines that we know about almost all occur within two months. Anaphylaxis is that horrible allergic reaction that people get immediately after, um, an, it's an immediate allergic reaction. It's when your throat swells shut and your eyes swell shut and you can't breathe and you're carried to an emergency room and you get a shot of epinephrine. That is a life-threatening allergic reaction. This occurs within about two hours, almost exclusively. That has happened with the Pfizer excuse me, and Moderna vaccines. And I think the latest one was at 15 hours in one individual. So that is known. We're not gonna see anaphylaxis from these vaccines six months later. If that happened six months later, it wasn't the vaccine, it was something else <clears throat> because of the way we know that anaphylaxis works physiologically. <coughs> excuse me. We do know with the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that some people will get low platelets and that occurs within about three weeks of getting the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. It's not shown to happen after that time. One of the more serious general side effects from a vaccine is called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a full body paralysis. It happens about six weeks after a vaccine is given. It is, happens about one out of every million influenza doses hard to know if it was due to the flu shot or if it was going to happen anyway. That has not been seen with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And the point of this slide is to let you know that scientifically, historically, over decades, we really don't see side effects of vaccines after about two months from the injection time. And you have to think through that logically also. If something happens to somebody four to six months later, in one out of a million recipients, how do we ever really know if it was the vaccine with that degree of rarity? When you look at the how well the vaccine worked to prevent COVID disease, let's look at the number of people that caught COVID disease with the vaccine versus the number of people that got it from the placebo. 
I mean, that got COVID disease after only getting a placebo. Out of 18,000 people studied with the Pfizer vaccine, eight people got COVID disease over a two month time period. If you got the placebo, there were 162 people who got COVID disease. And that gives us a vaccine efficacy there to the right of about 95%. There's about a 95% reduction in your risk of disease if you get the Pfizer vaccine to prevent COVID disease. And I believe that number is 94% for Moderna. Statistically, it was the same. They were both very effective. And then when you look at severe illness, this, this bottom graph <coughs> shows you how well this worked after just one dose. And you can see that if you got the vaccine, after one dose of the vaccine, there was one case of what we call severe illness. These are people that wind up in the hospital or in the ICU even, or they're on a ventilator or they die. So the vaccine after one dose had one case of severe illness. The placebo recipients after one dose had 14 cases of severe illness. When you look at dose two, after dose two, those who got the vaccine had zero cases of severe illness or death a week after they got the second vaccine. So some people, eight of them, still got mild illness, but no one was on a ventilator or died. Um, and then out of the placebo, five additional people um, had severe illness or death. So the vaccine efficacy to prevent severe disease or death in this study was 100%. We know that with post-marketing surveillance data, since the vaccine has been given, and there are something like 80 or 90 million doses of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have been given thus far, there, this, the low risk of disease holds up. It is still 90 to 95% effective at preventing disease in people that got the vaccine. Statistically, you know that since it is not perfect, that since it's not perfect, that the vaccine does have some failures. And I believe there has been one death in a vaccine recipient compared to um, thousands in those who are not vaccinated. That really is what I want to show you for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine data. The third vaccine is Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, which I didn't put in here because the data is changing rapidly. We know at the current time in the middle of April that that vaccine has been put on hold because of some blood clots and low platelets. At the current time when I'm giving this lecture, April the 20th, that's happened to six people in the United States for a relative risk of one in a million doses. It's happened in women between the ages of 18 and 48, and it has happened within the first two weeks after being vaccinated. One death has occurred, two people are still in the ICU and three have, or three people are still in the ICU and two have been sent home. So this is a serious effect that may be related to the vaccine in one in a million recipients. That's being evaluated by the FDA and the CDC. One death is too many from the vaccine. And so the vaccine is on pause and more information will be forthcoming over time. And I think that's all I've got. Thank you for asking me to speak.